Well, I am very delighted to have as my uh, guest today five individuals that are giants in the field of the history of vitrectomy. We have with us today Tom Auberg Sr., Wayne Fung, Steve Charles, Gary Abrams, and Jean Duan. Each one of these gentlemen are truly giants in our field, and their contributions in the development of vitrectomy, as well as their dedication to education, is certainly apparent. Welcome, gentlemen. I appreciate you joining us today. Today's discussion will focus on the personal insights and the uh, inception of modern-day closed vitrectomy systems uh, in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, as well as the vitrectomy development uh, uh, milestones in the, in the decades that followed. Before we begin our, uh, our trip down this timeline of the development of vitrectomy, I think we should set the stage of how we got to that point. And uh, there, there were opportunities to get into the vitreous prior to the development of an instrument to remove the vitreous. The earliest surgical intervention was the use of knives and scissors. People were taught in residency and in the concept of, of taking cataracts out that the, the vitreous was really a sacred area and you really didn't want to uh, violate the vitreous. The area of, of more advanced instrumentation, I think we began in the 1960s before vitreous was actually removed from the eye. And that was with Paul Sebus in, uh, in St. Louis, as well as Neubauer. What Sebus did is he, he pioneered the use of silicone oil and used silicone as an actual instrument. He used it to viscodissect vitreous bands, pushing the vitreous anteriorly in the eye while he drained subretinal fluid uh, uh, externally. Uh, again, inside the eye, not removing the vitreous. Now, the next step in the uh, evolution of vitreous surgery was an open sky approach to vitrectomy. Most people think that the first uh, open sky vitrectomy was done in Miami with Kasner, uh, but it actually was done in Japan with Sugio Dodo in Hiroshima, Japan. And Dodo performed this open sky vitrectomy in 1951 quite a few years before the pioneers down in Baskin Palmer uh, even thought about doing a vitrectomy. The success of that procedure stimulated Kasner and his other colleagues at, at Baskin Palmer, particularly Robert Mockimer, to move forward uh, with this. Gentlemen, let's, let's talk about this. Tom and Wayne, you, you were at, at Baskin Palmer at the same time as Kasner was performing these open sky uh, vitrectomies. Do you recall the perception of the, the fellows and staff and, and the people in the institution uh, of this open sky technique? When I got to um, Bascom Palmer, um, that was in 1966. Um, open sky was thought to be rather primitive. Uh, I remember there were all kinds of gymnastics people who were using open sky, trying to keep the uh, the endothelium of the um, cornea moist. Tom, you were uh, uh, at Baskin Palmer, uh, got there at the, at the very early stages when uh, Kastner was doing his open sky approach. What was your thought when you were there? Was the people feeling that open sky vitrectomy was just a, a crazy technique that, that uh, Kastner was, was doing, or, or was this uh, something that people were, were really excited to see? Well, I think everybody was excited for various reasons, and that really was the time that taking risks are what we take for granted right now, and that is it actually can save vision and not, not lose the vision. It was a complete reversal of what people had thought before, that if you cut out vitreous, the eyes gonna die. And uh, instead, you're saving vision, which just seemed to be heresy at the time. And it was really shortly thereafter that Robert Mockimer, also at Baskin Palmer, began his uh, development of, of a closed uh, vitrectomy. Again, people point to Robert as uh, perhaps the first person who did the, a successful closed vitrectomy, and that's not the case either. The first closed vitrectomy was also done in Japan, uh, not by Dodo. 
a gentleman by the name of Haruta, Chesburo Haruta. He did this in 1959, uh, quite a few years again before Mockamer's uh, report. So now we, we, we move 10 years later to Robert Mockamer. He began to develop a series of prototypes to go through not a cryo scar, but through the pars plana. And he developed an instrument that he called with the acronym the VISC, V-I-S-C, which stands for Vitreous Infusion Suction Cutter. The concept, though, was very similar to Ruta's in that there was a, a drill that uh, uh, Robert uh, developed with Jean-Marie Perel, um, an amazing uh, biomedical engineer and, and instrument maker, uh, also at Baskin Palmer at the time, that developed the original prototype VISC. There's a famous uh, image of Robert in his garage testing his uh, prototypes, trying to remove egg albumin. And this was again in the late 1960s. Um, so that brings us to the, the really now to the, the purpose of uh, our, our panel discussion now, because we're really starting from uh, uh, the late 1960s and early 70s, um, which is uh, the start of the heyday of, of vitreous surgery uh, instrumentation. Robert Mockimer, as I said, is regarded truly as the father of, of vitrectomy, not because he was the first, but because he was the one who pushed the instrumentation and the procedure uh, forward and encouraged other people to also uh, work with it and, and do it uh, as well. Uh, Robert arrived at uh, uh, Baskin Palmer in 1966. Ed Norton was so impressed with Mockimer that he offered him a faculty position to stay at uh, the renowned Baskin uh, Palmer uh, Eye Institute. Wayne, let me uh, come back with you. There was another pioneer uh, in uh, retinal surgery that people don't uh, really uh, know a lot about, uh, uh, at least the young people now, is a gentleman by the name of uh, Dorman Pichel. Did you have the opportunity to uh, uh, see uh, uh, Pichel uh, operate? Yes, I did. Um... I, as a resident, um, I operated with him on one uh, Saturday afternoon, and um, um, he only used a direct ophthalmoscope, and um, his Pichel pins, he had a, a special forcep, which uh, was attached to electricity, and when he wanted to drain, he would kind of uh, select an area that he thought would uh, would be proper after looking at the, the back of the eye with his direct ophthalmoscope. He would then uh, ask the nurse for his pins and they would hand him a, um, a, a kind of a, a platform with these little pins stuck in the uh, platform he would then take one of these electric uh, forceps, grab the pin by the by the back, and then push it through the uh, the sclerin choroid. And then, if if there was no drainage after the first pin, he would then insert a second pin, in until he got drainage. But um, uh, that was uh, very interesting. Robert had developed the, uh, the VISC at Baskin Palmer. You went out to, to California. Uh, did, did you use the VISC or what, uh, what, did you, what did you continue to use out there? Kirk, I uh, used the VISC. I, I used the VISC, which I took home with me. With the early cases, the cases went very smoothly because the, the vitreous fibrils were easy to cut because they had been partially digested. On about the third or fourth case, uh, I was uh, working through the vitreous and the the cutter, as you know, the, the cutting action was a mortar and pistol type of action. And the this person's vitreous was um, much more fibrous. And uh, as with every rotation of the piston then, I could see this membrane, which was fairly vascular, come towards the cutting tip uh, uh, about a millimeter at a time. 
obviously, I said to myself, you have to cut this somehow. So that is, I don't know if you gentlemen, you recall the knife, the needle knife that was called the Ziegler knife that um, we, we used to use occasionally and during cataract surgery. But anyway, so I, I asked for the Ziegler knife and that's how I learned to use both hands at the same time. Wayne, you, you and Tom overlapped a short time. Do you have any uh, recollections of, uh, or any stories uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of your time uh, uh, with, with Tom? My main recollection was, was seeing Bob Mockamer and Tom have an elegant lunch in the lab. And then, yeah, then uh, Tom stayed on af after I left. So 1968, Wayne, you left your uh, fellowship and you went into private practice in San Francisco. Uh, Tom, you finished your fellowship in 69 uh, the following year and, and went to the Medical College of Wisconsin and started the first retina service at, uh, at that institution. Robert uh, then performed his first human vitrectomy with the development of the VISC in 1970. So this is a uh, film of uh, Robert Mockamer performing one of his early vitrectomies with the VISC. You can see that the uh, uh, cut rate was about one per second. It was cut, cut, cut. Gary, you were you were there as a uh, as a resident when uh, uh, the uh, uh, some of these early vitrectomies were being done. What was your uh, uh, thoughts on when you saw one of these early vitrectomies done? Well, I'll have to say that uh, you know I was probably one of the luckiest people in the world in that. Uh, when I applied for residency, the first person I talked with at Medical College of Wisconsin was Tom Auberg. And uh, Tom and I hit it off pretty well. As a first year resident, I was operating with Tom. You have to realize Tom was a, always a gentleman, and he always is a gentleman. The worst thing Tom would ever say was, oh my. Tom never, it would never swear, it would say, oh my. We were doing this case, and uh, it was a patient who had been referred in from a long ways off, and uh, diabetic uh, detachment, and uh, Tom's doing it. It's one of the, I think it's a VIS-7, I think he was using, and uh, so we're working along here. He's, he's cutting along, and all at once, the thing stops cutting and starts wrapping the vitreous, and we see the, uh, uh, the peripheral retina come into view, Tom says, oh my, and then he says, oh my, again, and any time Tom said, oh my, twice, you knew we were in serious trouble, and uh, he says, I've never seen an eye recover from this, and so we had to put another instrument in and uh, cut, cut, cut the vitreous loose from the, uh, from the VIS-7, and uh, uh, you know, that was that was one of my early experiences, but I'll have to say the experience that uh, actually cemented that I was going to become a vitreal retinal surgeon was another case that we saw a little bit later. This was a woman who had been referred up from Chicago, and she had had a uh, vitreous hemorrhage for about 16 years that had never cleared. And she had, had, she had given birth to a uh, child uh, about the time she lost her vision. And she had never seen her son, who was now about 16 or 17 years old. And uh, Tom did a vitrectomy on her. And we went in and uh, examined her, the, took off the patch the next morning first post-operative day, and her son was in the room. And she saw her son for the first time. And it was just, it was an amazing thing. It was just, it, everybody, everybody shared in the joy that this woman had in seeing her son for the first time. Wow. To go back to your original question, Kirk, I was horrified at a couple of things I saw, but at the same time, uh, Nothing took me, nothing in medicine had ever stimulated me and, and 
and really brought joy uh, as much as what I saw with that patient who saw her son for the first time. The very first vitrectomy course was held uh, up in Milwaukee. And uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Tom and, and, and Gary, uh, you were uh, right there. That, tell me a little bit about that first vitrectomy course, Tom. The course came to mind because of uh, Robert's desire to have as many people in the country or countries and people registered from Japan and from Germany. Robert was determined to try and spread the technology as best he could. He was totally selfish uh, as opposed to selfish. He thought that if he spread the knowledge of the techniques that the actual instrumentation would follow and by the many engineers, some of which are right here on the panel. And that came about with the courses in Milwaukee and it used to rotate from Milwaukee to Hopkins to Bascom Palmer and there was a, a triangle of three of those three at least that the faculty would rotate through. Uh, in the meantime, the techniques and instrumentation was going by leaps and bounds and uh, other uh, centers were represented on that and many and several are, are on the uh, faculty here. There also was Henry Edelhauser, was also a faculty member. Uh, uh, Gary, tell me about Henry Edelhauser and what his uh, mark on the, the history of vitrectomy was. He was a basic scientist and a cornea physiologist. Uh, Henry developed a solution that uh, would maintain the corneal endothelium with a, you know, after hours of perfusion with this system. He worked with Alcon and his. Uh, solution ended up being what we call BSS plus. So Henry developed BSS plus. Uh, Henry was just uh, an amazing individual. He was a wonderful scientist. Uh, he later became Tom's uh, chief of research uh, when Tom uh, became the chair at uh, Emory. He mentored me uh, when I entered ophthalmology. Uh, even though he's a corneal physiologist, he mentored me in my uh, research on, uh, on SF6 gas uh, that I did uh, when I first arrived in Milwaukee. And uh, Henry was just a wonderful, wonderful scientist who, who truly understood all parts of science. And he could, he could plug himself into almost anything, you, any task you'd give him, and he'd figure it out how to do it. And uh, so uh, Henry, was, Henry was wonderful. He worked with us on everything, just about everything we did there in Milwaukee and then later at Emory when Tom went to, went to uh, Emory. The other person that was, was uh, on the faculty was George Blankenship. George was at, uh, at Bascom Palmer. George was one of the leading people at that, in that era in diabetic vitrectomy. And uh, that was sort of his specialty. And uh, uh, he just, uh, George was a wonderful teacher, wonderful scientist, and just a, a wonderful man and became a great friend. There were lots of things and excitement of, as this, the, the, uh, the, the specialty of vitrectomy was developing. Um, there were more than just the, the instrument itself. Gases were adjuvants, uh, they're important, and, and doing air fluid exchanges, we won't get into in a moment here too. Um, but I think something that people recognized along the way here too was the size of these instruments was was pretty large, and uh, it was large because the fluidics were easier to control. Um, but uh, the instruments started to get smaller, and one of the giants uh, who d developed a, an important instrument um, uh, that took us into the twenty gauge era was the development of this instrument here. Uh, this is the Occutome. Uh, this is the instrument that uh, that I trained with as a fellow, so I stepped in in the um, at the end of the 70s now uh, with this, and this was developed by Connor O'Malley. Connor decided to separate the functions of the visc 
to put illumination in one uh, port, infusion in another port, and then put the instrument uh, to remove the vitreous through a third port. So putting three holes in the eye was a was a novel uh, approach here uh, uh, too. Um, Steve, you you uh, uh, worked with or with Connor in, in teaching again with the Occutone courses. Uh, what, what's your re recollections of uh, of Connor O'Malley in, uh, uh, in in the development of the Occutone? Well, first of all, it's, it was a great development uh, to to have a very small lightweight cutter in your hand. It weighed twenty two grams. It was an axial cutter. It was the first cutter that was pneumatically driven, which uh, made it be much lighter instead of having a, a solenoid or, or an electric motor, a micromotor in the handpiece. But he was a, a, a very delightful guy. He was very humble. Uh, he was very kind. Uh, I, when when uh, Cooper Vision bought the technology from Berkeley Bioengineering, and then we do, began to develop the Occutum 8000, which is where I developed linear section. Instead of Connor O'Malley being threatened by that, he, he wanted to do a pic, joint picture at the Academy of the two of us in front of the Occutum 8000. Well, there was a series of courses that ran around the country uh, t teaching how to use the, uh, the Occutum. Uh, there was the Occutum newsletter, which are great fun to, uh, to read now uh, and think of the advances that were talked about in the newsletter. Uh, Steve, any recollections about the courses that you you participated in many of these uh, uh, around the, the country? We had a funny one in Hawaii. Uh, Ron Michaels and I were in Connor Mallow. We were doing a course, I think it was in April of 1980 or so. And, um, and, and Wayne Wong, who was the Key Wong's father, was the host. And uh, so we showed up on, on, on Saturday morning and, uh, and Ron Michaels was a no-show. He, he just disappeared and uh, and so uh, he had three lectures to give and I, and I said Connor we got a, an all-day course what do you want to do he said you know I don't really like the lecture would you mind giving Connor Mal uh, given Ron Michaels talks and mine I literally lectured from eight until five to this big Occutome course and uh, and then Ron Michaels reappeared the next day oh well I was uh, busy doing some things and and it, 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 I'll never forget Connor he, he was Connor I was totally calm. No problem. You can just give all the lectures. So now we're into the, the late 1970s, 78. Uh, and that was the year that Robert left Baskin Palmer to become uh, the chairman at uh, Duke. Uh, Gary, you uh, stayed on as faculty at, at Baskin Palmer with Harry Flynn. The VISC that was developed there, was that the instrument that uh, you and Harry continued to, uh, to use? When I started out in uh, uh, mid-79, or mid 78, I'm sorry. I was using uh, the, uh, I was still using the VIS 10. I went to the Veil vitrectomy meeting and uh, everybody was presenting papers uh, with the, uh, and showing videos or movies at that time of the uh, Occutone. And uh, so uh, I went back and uh, started using the Occutome and uh, never looked back at that point. Harry Flynn was the first one to use the Occutome at uh, Bascom Palmer. Dr. Norton uh, required that every new surgeon that came on board had to be proctored. So I proctored Harry on his first three cases and he was using the uh, Occutome and I thought, it, I thought it was pretty slick. But uh, I didn't start using it. It's probably another six months before I started using it when uh, after the veil vitrectomy meeting. We should pause for a moment here, too. We mentioned uh, Ron Michaels as uh, part of that uh, faculty, that original course. We'll talk a little bit about uh, Ron. Uh, Ron did his ophthalmology residency at uh, Wilmer, um, and then uh, he was uh, uh, a fellow at Baskin Palmer in 73 and 74, um, and then he was uh, uh, back to, to Wilmer where he was uh, hired uh, right out of his uh, uh, fellowship. Uh, but Ron was one of our key contributors to the early years of uh, vitrectomy, uh, not only for uh, developing some uh, thought and techniques about it, but certainly teaching. He was a brilliant teacher in, in that regard, and, and uh, it was a brilliant book that uh, he and Pat Wilkinson put together on retinal detachments. Um, and, but uh, he did it at a really quite a, a young age. In 1982, he was eight years out of fellowship and uh, was uh, uh, performed a, a, a vitrectomy on Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, one of the famous uh, boxers, so he achieved kind of rock star status. Gene, you were a resident uh, at uh, at Wilmer from 80 to 83. 
we were uh, it's the same year that we were residents together. Uh, I was in Chicago, um, uh, and you were there with uh, Ron. Uh, would you have to speak a little bit about uh, uh, your your thoughts were working as a resident with him, and and and, and yet you went to, uh, as to do your fellowship with Robert at, uh, at Duke subsequently. But um, tell me tell me about Ron. He was a great doctor. I mean, he he was absolutely dedicated to. Um, he brought that competitive sense to patient success, uh, but he was busy, you know, so he, and he kind of ran the OR on a clock. And, uh, so, I mean, if he hadn't, uh, fixed the eye in two hours, he would come back. Uh, he wouldn't continue to, to work. And he had all of these uh, things that are still stuck in my brain, you know, don't lose the ball game on the nasal side was one of his things that he would say. And I remember when Ron came back from a, a valvotrectomy meeting, I think it was in 82, he had seen uh, Relia Zivanovich's talk. He couldn't pronounce uh, uh, Zivanovich's uh, name, but he said he could do things that, that he couldn't do. And I just I didn't understand how is that possible? What, what are you even talking about? And uh, it was... Uh, you know, so that was kind of the the honor that we we held him to. You brought up the name Raylia Zavoinovich. Again, it's a name that uh, uh, young people today have no idea who you're talking about. Uh, Zavoinovich in Rotterdam is one of the great pioneers in vitrectomy in Europe at the time. Uh, gave us a lot of the principles of uh, PVR management in particular. Um, uh, was in the, the game of retinal tax and and uh, uh, get a lot of principles of, of silicone oil, uh, uh, but uh, a very humble man and, and uh, 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 again, a wonderful teacher. Um, the veil vitrectomy uh, was this invitation-only course that Robert put together to bring together thought leaders that Mockamer uh, determined, who were the thought leaders, um, every three years uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to see if it was a, to facilitate uh, thought and, and further our, our, our field. And the concept, which is still going on today, was a great one. There was a famous Veil Vitrectomy meeting in 1983, and that was one that Zavoinovich also came to. Uh, that was when I was a, a fellow, when, we, when you and I were fellows, uh, uh, Gene, and I remember Zavoinovich came through Atlanta, where I was doing my fellowship, and uh, showed his uh, films of uh, eye, operating on eyes that looked like Tysis. Um, but I think blow everybody away at the at that uh, at that Veil vale Vitrekman meeting in '83. Uh, Gary, would you like to speak a little bit about that that famous, probably the most famous Veil vale Vitrectomy meeting in in '83? I think it was probably without a doubt the greatest of all the Veil vale Vitrectomy meetings. And uh, while uh, Zavoinovich was the star, there's no question he was the star of the show uh, with the videos he was showing of these eyes, these pre tysical eyes that he was bringing back from the dead. Uh, some of these eyes he said he had operated on for 25 hours. Uh, and uh, it was just incredible. Uh, and one thing I remember about it is uh, some of these eyes, instead of giving a visual acuity as the result, he would give a visual field as the result. And, you know, that was the idea is that he was just giving them something. And uh, so uh, it, it was incredible. But there was a lot of other things at that meeting. Uh, Gene, you and uh, Brooks McEwen uh, at that meeting uh, talked about using a fish tank pump for fluid air exchange. After the veil vitrectomy meeting, uh, Tom... Tom Opberg, uh, working with uh, one of our technicians, Ron Heineke, and then then uh, Ron had a couple of friends. One was an electrician, and one was a uh, a guy who uh, uh, you know would build things. And they uh, uh, they put together they actually put together an air pump that had a servo mechanism where they could control the pressure, so it would keep a constant pressure. And it became a continuous infusion air pump. And uh, anyway, they published this thing in the AJO, and uh, uh, they they formed a, a company called Trek. That was the first production air pump. But the, the idea for the air pump, uh, as far as I know, and I, I don't know if anybody else had done it before then, was Gene and uh, Brooks McEwen 
with their uh, uh, they uh, with their uh, uh, fish tank pump and uh, Dyson and Dyson, right? That was pretty cool. That was a great. Uh, I think what in fact I. To this day, I think it's one of the greatest uh, contributions to vitrectomy was the development of the air pump. Uh, another thing at that veil vitrectomy meeting uh, was uh, uh, that's uh, I presented at that meeting the uh, uh, concept of uh, you know in diabetic vitrectomy we were having problems we would uh, do a do a vitrectomy using a BSS or BSS plus and they'd get a Poster subcapsular cataract intraoperatively uh, during the case, and uh, it, it was a significant problem with our diabetic vitrectomy. We'd end up having to remove a clear lens sometimes because of that. So once again, working with Henry Edelhauser, uh, we we actually uh, made some diabetic rabbits, and would perfuse these diabetic rabbits with uh, 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 various solutions. And we figured out that by adding three cc's of 50% dextrose to the infusion solution that we could prevent the cataract. And uh, I presented that at Vail. And, and you're talking about Ron Michaels a minute ago and uh, Ron's competitiveness. I, I, uh, Ron gets up and Ron had a very distinctive uh, way of talking. And he said, Gary, he said, I have never seen a cataract develop during uh, vitrectomy for diabetes. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, I just, I just, I don't know what you're talking about. And so I, I actually, I said, okay, Ron. And I said, I asked the audience, I said, has anybody out there ever seen a cataract form during diabetic vitrectomy? And about 90% of the audience put up their hand. And I said, Ron, I said, I don't know what you're using, but I said, your solution must be different than ours. And about, well, about two or three weeks after the veil vitrectomy meeting, I got a, got a letter from Ron. People had letters then. I got a letter from Ron, and Ron said, turns out that their infusion solution that they used at Hopkins was uh, made by their pharmacy. And it was essentially BSS plus, but it had a hundred milliliter of uh, glucose in the solution. And so that's the reason he was not seeing the uh, cataracts. So now we're into the 1980s. I think Gene, when, when you and I spoke about this, you called it the roaring 80s of vitrectomy. And uh, it certainly was because in the 70s, we, th we witnessed the development of the instrumentation to remove vitreous. But the concept of, or the specialty, I should say, of vitrectomy is so much more than just removing the vitreous. Removing the vitreous is, is nowadays is the easy part, but we added so many other things to it. One of the huge advances, in addition to the air pump, uh, that, that was a monumental is the addition of linear uh, uh, suction. Um, you know, the original Occutone was just on or off. Uh, the payment uh, uh, machine was just on or off in, in, in suction. You developed linear suction for the Occutone uh, system. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and you were, were brilliant in adding so many additional adjuvants to what we do with vitrectomy. Speak a little bit about that linear suction and can you catalog a little bit uh, about uh, all of the, the things that you added during the heyday of uh, the 80s of vitrectomy? The, the linear suction was, it was simply, you know, when you drive a car, you push the gas pedal down to, to go faster and you push it down less to, to not go so fast. So uh, I knew that we needed that and, uh, and that was developed on the Occutome 8000. But uh, one of the key elements is, is there people talk about faster and faster cutting rates over time, which I've pressed for for many years. We're now at 30,000 cuts per minute. But there's another thing that happened. Chambers got smaller and smaller and smaller so that you had faster response time to the foot pedal. And we used real-time operating systems. So as we progressed from the Occutome 8000 to the, the mid-labs one, the MVS machine, the, the chamber got smaller, so the response time was faster, Accurus even smaller, and then it was self-emptying, and the Constellation even faster. So faster fluidics is not just foot pedal control with linear or proportional control. That's an important thing. In terms of other techniques I added uh, that were facilitated by three-port vitrectomy, although you could do them with with a, with a single-port mockamer-like technique, that were 
not just fluid air exchange, but endo drainage of supplemental fluid, uh, forceps membrane peeling instead of a pick. Uh, the first peeling was done by Makamar with the bent needle, only two years after the first vitrectomy, no question. Uh, but then uh, uh, Conor Malley introduced the idea of a pick, which is much better than a bent needle because it was rounded. And then I developed the idea of forceps membrane peeling or pinch peeling. And then in the diabetics, I developed scissors segmentation first and then scissors delamination, adapting the Sutherland scissors that the late Jeffrey Sullivan developed for anterior segment surgery in Australia. And then of course, uh, they have a longstanding relationship with Grishaber to bring those things to the fore. In this heyday of the 80s, we've developed all these additional tools uh, in addition to just to removing the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the vitreous itself. So people start writing books about it. Steve, you've had a, a magnificent book, which is, I think, published in six languages now, I think. Six languages, um, six editions. The sixth edition came six out editions. last September. You know, one of the, the first books, too, was the, the book that uh, uh, was done by Mockhammer and Auberg. Uh, Tom, I want to call on you here as we, we wind this up here uh, to, to give us your recollection of writing that uh, first book on vitrectomy and, and how to teach uh, vitrectomy. Uh, uh, to the, 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 the population that was so anxious to learn about it. Uh, my wife and I had a small cabin up in uh, northern Wisconsin, and Robert had come up at one point and uh, saw the cabin, and apparently it reminded him of Germany where he, he, he grew up, and he loved it up there, and so he would come back and uh, we would write various chapters and things in the book. Um, and finally, we got to the point where we were almost done, but um, there was a vicious storm that came and, and knocked down a lot of trees, which wasn't that was uncommon for, <laughs> for Wisconsin actually, but um, we were stuck up there because the driveway was totally filled with trees that we had to chop up and so forth. And so he said, well, let's take the time and just write down what we n recall about, about the uh, techniques that were now going on. And so we had about another extra four or five days and we got the whole thing written. In the, thanks to the storm in, the, uh, in that time. Gene, you gave us a pretty monumental change too in, in, uh, in our history of vitrectomy here in the, uh, the movement to uh, smaller than 20 gauge. It was a time when 20 gauge was considered small gauge uh, when Conor O'Malley uh, came up with it. And then you took the next step to truly de redefine small gauge. Uh, tell us a little bit about that quest, uh, Gene. My main motiv motivation is I thought there must be a way of entering the eye that is simpler than the way we were doing it, doing conjunctival dissection and suturing the, the wounds and and suturing the, the conch and cutting, you know, all the diathermy associated with it. Just uh, I thought there must be an easier way. And uh, there was a, an experiment, I think Mike Tracy had done the experiment uh, showing that 25 gauge was the largest uh, needle track that didn't leak. And then it, we, we came up with, you know, first metal, then we came up with these little very thin polyimid tubes uh, and we were able to get, you know, largely self-sealing wounds going through the the conch and it was it was um, it was brilliant. One of the fellows I remember said, "Oh no, the fellowship's over," uh, because the, the the vitrectomy and the the procedure went so quick uh, that there was no opening and closing that had been associated with turnover of these cases. Gene, I think uh, I think your introduction of micro, micro incisional vitrectomy is without a doubt one of the greatest advances in the history of vitrectomy. And uh, if you look at management of primary retinal detachment, uh, currently it looks like about 83% of uh, 
primary regmatogenous retinal attachments are now managed with uh, primary vitrectomy. That would not have happened without microincisional vitrectomy. And, and you know, now uh, valve cannulas, things like that, that uh, uh, have improved the uh, uh, fluid dynamics of the eye. This would not have happened if we were still using 20-gauge vitrectomy. I like to weigh in on that. I, I totally agree, but I'd like to add one thing. We haven't mentioned wide-angle visualization, and that's the other enabler of, of, of using vitrectomy to repair retinal detachment. The first one to do it that people forget was Reuben Belfort, uh, and he used the, the Rodenstock pan fundoscope and at the very first veil meeting and presented that. Uh, but there was no inverter then, and, and the skill set to operate in a mirror mode is really, really challenging. And so, uh, of course, Stanley Chang popularized, uh, not only he brought us PFO for giant breaks, which is a, an enormous accomplishment, and PFO for, for PVR, but he popularized contact-based wide angle, uh, whereas others popularized the, the biome, which uh, I think first was at Jules Stein. Uh, but uh, at any rate, wide angle visualization was a huge advance. Was that Manfred Spitznas or was that Ruben? Correct. Correct. Absolutely. In 1910, Derek Vale sent out a survey nationally asking people who we knew were doing, attempting to do retinal detachment repairs, what their techniques were and what their success rate was. And when he compiled all of the responses, he determined that the success rate in repairing retinal detachments in 1910 was 0.1%. And then Jules Gonan presented his uh, paper uh, and it, when he originally introduced it in the, uh, 1919, but actually presented a series in, in Chicago at the Academy, uh, at the Palmer House about 10 years later. Uh, but his original uh, presentation uh, with this instrument was a 60% success rate using a Paclin cautery. So to go from 0.1% to 60% was a pretty big, uh, pretty big change. Um, and then we've discussed just really the tip of the iceberg here with us uh, uh, today um, with all of these additional uh, 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 developments. Uh, the giants that we really should talk more about, too, is the, the engineers, Carl Wong, Dyson Higginbotham, uh, Hans Grieshaber, uh, Jean-Marie Perel, uh, great men that uh, helped uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the giants that, that I'm sharing this panel with uh, here today. Uh, but then we, 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 we ended up uh, here with uh, uh, the, the, the small gauge uh, microincisional techniques, and we're able to do some amazing things with this. Uh, and even though the material costs are a few dollars, uh, the, the thought that, that came into it is, is uh, tremendous. And it's connected to a machine that is as complicated as a, as a 777 uh, uh, Boeing, in my opinion. Um, but it, it uh, and even though we're able to do some amazing things, the challenges are still here. The heyday was maybe in the 80s and into the 90s of all the additional developments that were exciting to see. Uh, uh, but there's still so much more uh, that we need to, to, to learn and do and develop. Uh, we are humbled by uh, PVR. Uh, we, we, there's still unpredictable things that happen to us in the operating room. Uh, pay, Patients are still challenged by positioning with gas, the, the cataract that develops uh, following uh, uh, vitrectomies. Um, uh, so again, there's, there's still a lot uh, of room for new development here. So uh, hopefully uh, the next generation will, will carry us through. Uh, gentlemen, it's, it's great to hear these personal recollections and story uh, during the heyday of vitrectomy. I want to thank you for all of your amazing contributions that you've all uh, helped uh, further this, uh, this marvelous uh, uh, procedure that we call vitrectomy. Uh, it's been a great time talking with you all. So uh, thank you. And, uh, and on behalf of all of the, the ophthalmologists and retinal specialists uh, around the world, Thank you for your contributions and sharing with me.